Welcome to Hard Talk with me, Zainab Badawi. I've come to Manly in Sydney, Australia, to talk to one of the world's most distinguished authors, Thomas Keneally. He's written more than 30 novels, including his most famous, Schindler's Ark, which was made into an Oscar-winning film, Schindler's List. Now in his 80s, as he reflects on modern-day Australia, does he believe it's a country that's matured in its identity or is it still divided on race and culture? Thomas Keneally, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you, Zainab. You've written about a huge range of topics, um, the American Civil War, Australia, of course, the First World War, Joan of Arc, Napoleon. How do you go about choosing a subject for a book? Well, it's generally some weird connection with Australia that begins me in that uh, I heard that there was a family on St Helena who knew Napoleon and then they got so close to Napoleon that they fell out of favour and were sent where the British sent everyone unsatisfactory in the 19th century to Australia. And so uh, I... Uh, uh, love those connections between the old world because I was raised in an Australia that considered itself to be out of the world, the sort of the last thing before the penguins of Antarctica. <laughs> so you start with your home country and then link to the rest of the world. All right. You're very drawn to moral dilemmas. And in fact, in your youth, you trained to become a priest. And then yes. you say a loss of faith made you change your mind. However, has religion, morality, how has it influenced your work? Well, I, I think there's a tradition in uh, moral argument typified in Judaism of, you know, taking hours to discuss whether you should give a camel a drink or not and in which vessel it should be. Uh, and I uh, love those moral arguments and are drawn to them. Above all, having grown up in a country at fairly much at peace with itself and having been white in that country, uh, I uh, ask myself how I would have behaved if I were uh, an SS man, for example. And that's one of the engines that drove my interest in the, the Schindler book, to ask myself, with the correct conditioning, and I was conditioned to the, uh, towards the Catholic priesthood in my childhood, with the correct conditioning, could I be a killer? Uh, could I be filled with the right strain of ideology uh, to give me, to empower me, uh, to pull that trigger? And uh, it's often questions of that nature uh, that I look at. Now, in the case... Well, would you have pulled the trigger? Could I, you I have don't felt know, that you could have I'm been... pleased I'll probably uh, never find out. I, uh, the price for not pulling the trigger is, of course, very extreme under that regime. And so when you have an upside-down system where Himmler says courage is to stand, or morality, rather, is to stand on a heap of 500 bodies and feel nothing, if I'd been taught that, uh, could I have, uh, have done it with the right conditioning? And I'll never know, thank God. Mm. I'm never likely. I'm 83. I don't think you would have somehow. <laughs> I, I do tend to be troubled institutionally. Mm. I, I hope that that would stick with me in those extreme situations. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to hear that. But you've written more than 30 novels, but it is Schindler's Ark uh, for which you won the Booker Prize that um, really is the book that people most associate with you. But there was some controversy when you were awarded the prize for it. And of course, it was made into the Oscar winning film um, Schindler's List, starring Liam Neeson, the German industrialist who, who saved more than 1,200 um, German Jews from, from the Nazis. But there was a, the controversy was because it wasn't a book of fiction. You, you wrote it as though it was a sort of a novel, but your plot was already there. It was based on yes. a true story. So it was the greatest multifaceted uh, uh, lens through which to look at the Holocaust one could encounter. And the survivors wanted it told literally. Mm. Um, and uh, I was happy to accommodate them in the spirit of... Um, 
uh, of uh, in cold blood in the Truman Capote factional uh, in uh, fictional factional spirit mm. uh, and uh, so I it was registered as a novel and it won the booker mm. now this was as you say an intense controversy for a while and I think the book of uh, people have shown their um, uh, they knew it was a mistake they shouldn't have made by never nominating me for a booker again <laughs> But, uh, it, because the plot was there. I mean, do you mm. think that some of the criticism was legitimate for that reason that you based it on a true story? I based it on a true story and I tried to tell it in the spirit of Truman Capote's In Cold Blood and in the spirit of the new journalism mm. too. And therefore, it was... I would have been hard if uh, condemned for brought before a court for uh, passing myself off as a novelist. In that case, I would have had quite an argument on my hands, I admit. Mm. One of your most famous early novels was The Chant of Jimmy Blacksmith, about a mixed-race Aboriginal man who goes on a killing rampage. Um, it, one could say to you, look, how could you, as a white Australian, put yourself in the shoes of an Aboriginal man is that an example of cultural appropriation yes i believe it it wa was at the it wasn't seen so at the time but i've since said that if i were writing the chant of jimmy blacksmith for which the aboriginals have forgiven me uh, that if i were writing now i would leave the interiority the interior world of the aboriginal to them because they've been there there is a whole uh, cohort of uh, gifted uh, Australian novelists, so uh, uh, Jonathan Birch, for example, uh, emerging from amongst Aboriginal people, and they are the people who should tell that story from within. So I. But have... are you not doing the same thing again with your latest novel, your new book just out, the Book of Science and Antiquities, when ah. you put yourself in the mind? of an Aboriginal who lived 42,000 years yes. ago. Well, we had Homo sapiens here and dominant uh, very early. It, dominant, I say, because uh, of the megafauna that surrounded them. Uh, there were uh, the, the species that uh, surrounded the early Aboriginal Australians uh, were phenomenal and they were protein on legs and on big legs. And so the uh, Paleolithic Aboriginals lived very well. And it did come to this time, I wanted to write about two old men, a modern old man like myself dying and uh, uh, of cancer, which I then had. So I was used, not letting my research go to waste. And then <laughs> uh, this Paleolithic man whom I've encountered and whom I've known, I feel he's my soulmate, this Paleolithic human being. But I don't see him as Aboriginal, although he is the forerunner of three Aboriginal tribes. The traditional owners of that area are his descendants. But I see him as fair game because he's early Homo sapiens. Now, at the time, he was living high on the hog or on the deprototon, to name one uh, mega uh, big ancient animal, uh, my forebears were probably in Central Asia, living f somewhat more uh, miserably, but pursuing the same mm. mental journey, both the mental and spiritual journey, of, of deciding how to behave as humans. And so because my forebears had been there too, I felt mm. it was okay to write okay. All right. about so are you, Mungo Man. Are you trying to make a point there to the modern world that Aboriginals have lived in Australia for longer than we had yes. originally thought? Is that the message you want to... And give? that's the... Oh. I, I felt that with the case of Mungo Man, whom I put as learned man in my novel, that he is an Australian phenomenon. He is a world phenomenon. He's the first ritual burial of a human. 
42,000 years ago, he was adorned with ochre that came from 200 miles away. Implements were used in his burial that came from another community of Homo sapiens mm -hmm. way up in the Australian Alps. So I just want to know, uh, Australians to know that there were humans who were a going concern and who were living well uh, two ice ages ago in Australia uh, and that that's our history too. That that spiritually at least is... is our history uh, and that Mungo man who should have a great center unto himself in central Australia was buried quite hmm. not routinely but but he's returned to country he's taking taking the skeleton back to his country and reburying it hmm. by the three tribes was not a big Australian event and it should have been it should have been because it makes a mockery of the way Aboriginal history was taught to us. The sort of Aboriginal history that was taught to us was all we needed to take the country away and to consider it terra nullius, earth belonging to no one, mm -hmm. so we could just take it. Uh, and uh, uh, the more we relish and celebrate this uh, uh, Paleolithic history, mm. the more untenable our views about Aboriginals are going to be. But here we are in modern day Australia, 25 million population, about 3.5% are um, Aboriginal, and um, yet we know that their life expectancy is about 10 years shorter yes, than the average Australian, and it? infant mortality is twice the rate of others. I mean, do you think now that things are getting better for the Aboriginals? Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister, has appointed a new for the first time ever, an Aboriginal as a cabinet minister, Ken Wyatt. As the, yes, yeah. indeed. Good, good progress being Pro made? Progress and progress in education, but it is not automatic. It is uh, two steps forward and one step back. And a lot of the damage that's been done was done well-intentionedly. I mean, I suppose you can say that of every great human injustice but, for example, the removal of Aboriginal children is an example, an, ex an ex extreme violation of human rights, which the administrations of the past saw as a solution mm. to the problem of having a large, unreconciled uh, native population in the hinterland. Uh, they were removed from their families and they, they were, were resettled from with their white parents. Families. But in didn't... 2008, the Prime Minister at the time, Kevin Rudd, issued a complete and utter yes. apology for that. Yes, indeed. Good. And it's, uh, so there so was it, a recognition it, it of the injustice. It was an example of, yeah. of things being done in the name of virtue and progress in the past that was a terrible violation of how people felt. And I've met Aboriginals who were of the stolen generation and there's no doubt that it has damaged them hugely. Mm. What does the treatment of the Aboriginals tell us about Australians today and the vast majority of course are, are like you, the descendants of, of the white settlers? Um, because I, I give you a quote from one British American comedian, John Oliver of The Daily Show, and he said this after he visited Australia. Australia turns out to be a sensational place, albeit one of the most comfortably racist places I've ever been in. They've really settled into their intolerance like a resentful old slipper. <sighs> I mean, is that a fair comment, or would you say that, you know... The, the, it, it is. Just, he it, would it, have oh, meant plenty of people who would have justified that comment. And uh, on the other hand, he would have uh, met the uh, sort of Australian who considers that understanding Aboriginal history is the way to establishing our legitimacy, that, that our legitimacy can't be had at the price of denying theirs. Uh, this Australia was a huge land grab and that we can come to terms with that uh, cooperatively and through figures of reconciliation which force the reality of ancient occupation upon us in the way that Mungo Man does. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is reconciliation there, there is a solution there and there's 
uh, knowledge there, the sort of knowledge that puts paid to narrower uh, versions of the Aboriginal mm. story. You like to write a lot about culture and identity. It's a recurring yeah. theme in so many of your books. And you describe yourself as an Irish Catholic Australian. But I wonder why you need that kind of hyphenated identity. Why can't you just say, I'm an Australian? Because once you start saying, I'm this kind of Australian, that kind of Australian, that doesn't that introduce divisions? Immediately. Uh, it's not meant to, uh, certainly not as I use it. It is meant to acknowledge whose one's ghost is. We all have a different dreaming, we all have a different set of icons, we all, which, which are soul enriching and which come partly from the old world where our ancestors came from and after all ancestor worship was one of the great religions and we want to mediate that story to the world so everyone's allowed to have their their ghosts and it but it is common right-wing people conservative people do say oh we just want to be we don't want to be greek australian we just want to be australian australian but they're generally of the anglo tradition a lot of them and so there is a continuity for them in their British origins and their British identity here. Mm. So when, when you talk about um, identity and you know the other and so you have said because you are an ambassador of the Asylum Centre here in Australia you made that in 2015 and you have said how asylum seekers are treated in Australia is the greatest test of our national honour and honesty, the way we welcome and or punish the yeah. asylum seeker. And of course we've and got... And it's a test we have but frankly really, failed. It, but I mean, is, is that, why is that the test of national honour? Well, it is the test of national honour because it's bad for uh, liberal democracies, for governments to lie. And to get us in a position where we can countenance the excision of various territories from parts of Australia, so that if a refugee turned up on, their, on a boat, uh, it didn't entitle them to seek asylum. Well, that's when they went because to Christmas Island and right, that was made not Christmas, part of Australia. And, and then Nauru, and which is Nauru. independent, and yeah. Manus and so on. Which These is in were, Papua, Papua uh, New Guinea. And so uh, we... Um, uh, began by uh, arguing that to save Australia from terror, uh, we had to um, keep these people in permanent detention. And so we have had what can only be called concentration camps in mm -hmm. Australia, run uh, by uh, often to the wealth of international corporations, which upsets me too, because uh, they're not run but, by the Australian public service ex exhaustively, but they are, uh, uh, they are um, camps in which people are punished for having, psychologically, for having the ambition to being Australians. Mm. May I say, there is a big lie. Mm. We have to punish these people to stop them taking boats across the Arafura Sea to Australia. Many of them will drown if they do. And so either you're in favour of our punitive regime of punishing people, uh, not the people smugglers, mm. but the people who get smuggled, smuggled, punishing them for wanting to be Australian, to wanting to seek haven, uh, if we ease up on them, we'll only encourage the boat smugglers. Now, there is a third method, a, a plan that hasn't even been tried. What if you save all the money you're spending on foreign corporations running these concentration camps, put your officials into Bali, where the refugees yeah. are uh, turning up, and use your officials and use the money you're wasting on hysteria at the moment. Yeah. Use that money but to process those people that's there. That's suggested, but they, they call them detention centres or concentration camps. But the fact is, it's difficult for governments, isn't it, Thomas? It Kennedy? is difficult because for governments. Because you can't allow unfettered 
you know, now, numbers of asylum then, seekers coming. Even and then. it's not even a kind of a right wing thing in the use of right wing, but actually Labour prime ministers, Labour governments, as yes. well as the Liberal, which are the Conservative, you know, My party niece here. is the shadow minister well, for so Home it's Affairs. Difficult, so isn't it's difficult. It? Her, it's on her plate. And public opinion on the whole supports governments keeping out it, yes, both people. Yes, indeed. But uh, I, I think it's been done with smoke and mirrors and lies. And the, the real option, the civilising option, the only option that's going to work in Europe or here yeah. uh, is if there is uh, collaboration across many governments. Mm -hmm. And I know the Hungarians don't want... But there has to be agreed on terms for dealing with this problem because it is delusional to think it's going to stop. Uh, there are 60 million of these people worldwide. They're a nation in the midst of us and we won't be able to deal with them by just saying no, 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 no. When you look at Australia, you see that nearly half of the population, 49%, were either born abroad or one of their parents was mm -hmm. born abroad. So it is a very welcoming country, a country built by immigrants starting in the 18th century with the British um, uh, coming here. So how, how would you describe Australia today in terms of being a, a successful multicultural country, which many of its, you know, people here say it is. Yes, uh, there is an undeniable generosity in those who have it. Uh, no, I'm not talking about myself. These are noble people. The, there's an undeniable uh, uh, tolerance combined with great political incorrectness. I think the Americans, with all due respect to Oliver, uh, the Americans say one thing, they're careful about what they say, their language is cleaned up, but they're primitively racist often at base. The Australians often say something outrageous, but they're practically non-racist at base. Not always, I don't want to romanticise us, uh, always a mistake to ra romanticise anyone. I'm not trying to excuse Australian racism, but it is the truth that uh, uh, amongst men in particular, um, the uh, British Isles working class tradition of expressing affection through mutual insults is very strong. So don't take what some of the, <laughs> so, yeah. the abusive invective at face yes, value. Yeah, yes. There is the stereotype, particularly the Australian male, as being this rather chauvinistic, almost misogynistic yes. character, as the former Prime Minister Julia Gillard said. Almost misogynistic. You, you're too kind to us. <laughs> well, Julia Gillard, former Prime Minister, <laughs> yes. talked about that. Finally, you're very famous for your work ethic, Thomas Keneally. You already started your uh, next book. You've just got one out, but have you already started ah, well, the next Well, you one? know, this is uh, Australia and the world. I I'm fascinated by the fact that uh, Australia was the netherworld to which 19th century British sent its people. And uh, Dickens sent his son. This novel is going to be about Dickens' youngest son. Charles Dickens. Charles Dickens' youngest son, Charles Dickens' girlfriend, Charles Dickens' <laughs> family collapse. Charles Dickens' son, Plorn, in Australia in 1868. We look forward to it. Thomas Keneally, thank you very thank much you indeed very for much. coming on Hard Talk. Thank you. Thank you.